Welcome back to the Governance Podcast at the Center for the Study of Governance and Society at King's College London. My name is Sam DeCanio. I'm a lecturer here in the Department of Political Economy, and I'm also the Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Governance and Society. Today, we are very pleased to host Stephen Skoranek, a Pelatia Parrott Professor of Political and Social Science at Yale University. Professor Skoranek has published widely on American politics and American political history. He was one of the co-founders of the journal Studies in American Political Development, and he's currently the Winant Professor at the Rothamer American Institute at Oxford University. Today, we're going to be discussing the policy state. Um, Professor Skronik's most recent book that was co-authored with Karen Oren of UCLA and which was recently published with Harvard University Press. Thanks for, thanks for being here, Steve. It's good to be here. Um, I wanted to start with just a few general questions about your research. Uh, so you study American political history, what some would call American political development. So this is the study of how American political institutions were created, how they change over time. Can you tell us just a little bit about how you initially became interested in the historical study of American politics? Uh, well, that probably uh, that goes back to uh, graduate school when I studied. I took a my first year of graduate school at school. I took a course called Bureaucracy and Democracy. It's basically a historical, historically oriented uh, development of modern states course. I got caught up in a kind of um, a group of scholars who were interested in um, the work of Barrington Moore and Sam Huntington, uh, were people thinking broadly about uh, patterns of institutional development in different states and how uh, uh, different states configured authority differently and with what consequences. So it was uh, that graduate st school environment that got me um, thinking about what is the nature of the American case? And I was happened to happen to be lucky enough to study with Ted Lowy uh, uh, at Cornell, who um, whose book, The End of Liberalism, uh, was in fact a study of institutions and the pro the crisis. What he subtitle of the book, The Crisis of Authority in America. So uh, very uh, sympathetic to this this way of thinking about American government, and American politics. So your interest was, it sort of occurred once you were a graduate, once you were a graduate student at Cornell. So I went to graduate school to study political philosophy. And in fact, I was, uh, my major advisor was uh, Isaac Kramnik, as political philosopher. Um, but as I moved into, I had to take comparative politics as a field, as a field requirement. I took this course on bureaucracy and democracy. It seemed to me that many of the questions I was interested in that interested me in political theory um, were being addressed by people who were thinking about institutional development, changing configurations of authority, variations in state structures over time. And so it was an interesting, it was an easy transition for me. I actually got interested in um, how America, how closely American political thought is tied to institutional um, configurations or institutional reform and political thought in America are so closely intertwined that it was a very easy transition for me to make. Hmm. So when you initially were planning on going to graduate school as a theorist, hmm. were there specific theorists that you were interested in studying? Uh, well, I. <laughs> this is a very long story. I won't bore you with it. Um, so I was, right. So this was the... Uh, early 1970s, I was interested in uh, what at that time was the Marxist revival of theories of the state. I was interested in people like Nikos Palantzis and Ralph Miliband and uh, uh, the institutional turn in, uh, in sociological theory, social theory and Marxist theory in particular. Kapitalstadt, I remember, was the name of the journal that we all read as, uh, uh, as undergrads. Um, so, yeah, so I was attuned to these kinds of issues and, uh, and um, the, the transition between political theory and the study of institutional development was a very, seemed to be a very easy one to make at that time. I mean, this was also, you know, this was also the time when Theodore Scotchpole was... Yeah 
writing states and social revolutions and the whole movement of bringing the state back in, I think that my early work was very much a part of that. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so on that, on that point, do you remember when Theta Scotch Ball wrote States and Social Revolutions? She also wrote, uh, she was one of the editors in, in Bringing the State Back In, right. published in 1985. Right. Do you remember when that volume came out, what, whether there was, there was any sort of sense in political science at the time as a discipline, um, how people, how, how did people view it when, when that, when that? I think that was a huge volume and it had a, uh, it had a, an enormous impact. The whole movement toward comparative study of states, varieties of capitalism, um, uh, comparative state development, American political development, all of that was a very, it was a very exciting time. And a sort of a breaking down of disciplinary divisions between history and political science, sociology and political science, social theory and political science. Um, yeah, that it was a moment in which we, uh, which we saw a whole new community of scholars take place. That's when we studied. We started the journal Studies in American Political Development. You know, now what is it? And it's probably in its uh, closing, closing in on thirty years. Great. Um, okay, so uh, what what which brings us to your current book? Um, what led you to write the policy state? Was there was there any sort of set of arguments that 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 were had been developing in 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 your mind or in discussions with Karen Oren? What what led to this book being being produced? Well, I think that uh, so I think Karen would answer this differently than I I do. I mean, I think that the idea of in her book on uh, belated feudalism, which talks about the labor revolution, at the end of that book, she 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 discusses the future as a fully legislated polity, a fully legislative polity. So I think that was sort of the germ of the idea. What would, what would we do with that idea, right? For me, uh, it was very much a response to uh, my, first, my dissertation. My mm -hmm. first book, Building a New American State, was about the creation of the administrative state. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this book, uh, it was for me a kind of revisiting that a sense that we're no longer in the administrative state. We uh, were be some. There's a new formation that's uh, emerging that uh, doesn't really uh, that has administration, but it's not organized around administrative ideals, <laughs> the ideals of an administrative state. And so, in this book, for me, it was well, what lies beyond that administrative state, which, and what is this a newly emergent form? And that's where we came to this idea of a pol the policy state, it's a much more elemental uh, and much more disaggregated form. Disaggregated in the sense that you see non-administrative actors as playing a central role yeah. in, in governance? Well, the things that you would that are the uh, qualities that I associate with a, an administrative state, rule regularity, uh, the authority of professionals and experts, all of that I see as beginning to unravel, uh, and um, unravel it, and that unraveling having taken place over many decades, I would date it back to the 1970s, in the United States, back to the 1970s. And I, we related in this book to this, the what we call the abrasive qualities of policy, that is to push against, um, to abrade against institutional boundaries and rule regularity. So I think about what's happening in Congress, we talk about the collapse of regular order. Right, the collapse of regular order, I think, is a kind of metaphor for what's happening in various institutional locations. Uh, that I think is very different than what you get, certainly out of a very varying conception of legal rational authority. Right, it's a much more disaggregated, contested uh, world that doesn't really. Uh, uh, rules and regularity are uh, in sh in short supply. And what would be what would be a specific example that you could give that that you think is emblematic of that of that transition? 
So would you would you see the conflicts over Obamacare? Um, well, I, I mean, I'll give you a, 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 a. So we want to say that policy abrades against mm-hmm. uh, rules and regularity. So think about Trump's declaration of a national emergency to build his wall. This book is organized. What is the policy? The policy motive drives mock contemporary politics. So what it's driving against are all those things that were supposed to resist policy, right? What are those things that are supposed to resist policy? Like structure of government is one, right? The basic structure of government. So when Trump says, well, Congress refuses to pass money for my wall, I'm going to declare a national emergency and we're going to build the wall. This is exactly what we mean by policy, the policy motive, Mm -hmm. policy driven erosions of structure. Right? And then Congress says, well, you can't do that. We, we have a constitutional authority to appropriate money. Well, good luck. So we'll see how that works. We'll see how that works out. Mm-hmm. So, the, so, the form of, so in a certain way, you see the form of governance that the policy state is displacing yeah. is a stable administrative organization. Maybe well, it doesn't the, even have to be administrative. The administrative state was the most mm-hmm. recent incarnation mm-hmm. of a kind of, and we want to date that, I think, quite specifically to a consolidating movement around right after World War II when all the institutions of government seem to have come to a, um, uh, I wouldn't say an agreement, that's probably too strong, but an acceptance of administrative authority mm-hmm. and, uh, and administrative decision-making. That, I think, all begins to unravel after the 1970s. Um, and, yes, yeah, so... Um, so one thing is that it's displacing administration, but I think it's much broader than that, that policy has from the very beginning. I mean, you know, American governments always made policy. We want to say from the very beginning, the policy motive has been eroding all the things about government that are not policy, all the things about government. And in America, what does that mean? What are the things about American government that are not supposed to be policy? Rights are not supposed to be policy, and structure. Right? And what we see over the course of it, as policy expands its reach or policy extends its domain, it abrades against the boundaries of rights and structure. That's what we want to say. Okay. And not only that, but rights and structure begin to, uh, to uh, take on the qualities of policy. They become negotiable. They become... Um, uh, contest much more contestable. They become um, um, pragmatic. So you have in the pot we describe judges making pragmatic decisions. Well, you know it says that she has this right, but if we granted that right, the whole judicial system would you know be overrun with these complaints. So it's like very pragmatic. We can't have that, mm-hmm. right? So it's a po- rights themselves take on this kind of pragmatic, programmatic negotiable quality in the policy state. Structure takes on this negotiable quality. Well, it says in the Constitution that Congress has to appropriate the money. Well, Congress doesn't appropriate the money. And the president says, well, we need the policy, right? So we're going to have the policy anyway. This is policy driving, abrading against the boundaries of structure. So why why do you think this transition happened? Uh, well, I mean, in the book, we describe, um, we just, desc- and, and we're not taking, I, I should say that the book is not taking issue with the impetus behind these developments. And the reason is that we recognize that this policy state is far more inclusive than what it replaced. And it's actually far more responsive than what it replaced. In the sense that it's so permeable. So we want to say that, uh, this, the world in which rights and structure uh, had more purchase mm-hmm. was a rule that was was a world that was very exclusive. A lot of people were left out. A lot of people were left out. Women, slaves, labor. They didn't have rights. The masters had rights. The husbands had rights. The employers had rights. Those rights were enforceable. 
as more and more, as those old prior rights are overturned and more people are included, more people have rights, rights have to be balanced against one another, rights themselves become less categorical. It's like uh, we refer in the book to uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who says we can't, you know, what criticizes a categorical approach to rights and says we well, you have to adjudicate rights in terms of the neighborhood of principles in which they operate. Well, you know, it's that is adjust adjust rights to your principled understandings of what a good polity should be. It becomes much more contestable, much more negotiable, much more um, much, and that's and this is I think why. Um, why contests over the appointment of justices have become so explosive right. because now it's your rights are wholly dependent on the principles of the judges that you're <laughs> that you're appointing right that neighborhood of principles is like everything the right is completely contingent right um so on on the one hand i can see how that's uh, that is more inclusive there are far the, the number of groups that can influence policy is like it's clearly expanded and the number of people who have rights right who, yeah but for us what's happened is that rights rights as uh, Dworkin said rights are trumps I think that was a normative position rights should be trumps but in fact in a democratic polity rights are not trumps right rights what we argue in the book is that in the policy state rights are chips that is, they're tokens of access to a choice setting where the actual determination is very much, uh, very much dependent on who the judge is, what the principles of the judge, is, who the decision makers are, their preferences and their principles. Right. So rights for us are not nothing. It makes a difference that all these people have access. Right. But that's what they have. They have access to a choice setting, in which. The actual balance, you know, uh, uh, the actual balance among these rights is contingent on the decision makers themselves. Mm -hmm. um, does yeah, as opposed to, you know, uh, an employer could go to a court and get an injunction against those employees because they didn't have a right, right? The husband could take the kids. And the wife didn't have a right, right? Those were trumps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those mm -hmm. rights were trumps. These rights, when everybody's included, everybody's in, rights become less Trump-like and much more chip-like tokens of access. So on the one hand, I could I could see why this feature of the policy state would would be considered a good thing, uh -huh. in the sense that that rights are expanding, uh -huh. um, more people have access. Right access to them. Right. Do you see any potential downsides to this? Well, yes. Of yeah. so, yes. So what are so the downsides the, that you, the, 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 the book? The book is called An American Predicament. Yeah. The predicament is that we make this more inclusive polity, a more democratic polity. But the things that you depend on for rule regularity, right? rule dependability, um, uh, the uh, uh, St the stability of institutions, all of these things begin to erode. So what the book is about are the consequences for governance of inclusion, right? You have this 18th century constitution that's riddled with these conflicts, uh, which were largely ways of keeping, you know, ways of keeping those people who were out, out. Now that everybody's in, the institutional system itself no longer has the legitimating rules to um, to make its commitments credible. So, you know, Trump may get his wall, but nobody, half of the country is going to think this is an illegitimate act, right? Mm -hmm. right? You could make a, uh, a health care, you could pass a health care program in, uh, 2010 and in 2014 it begins to unravel nothing is secure or stable in the policy state so the downside is 
the collapse of secure authority, right? the collapse of authority, the crisis of authority, the shakedown of institutional authority is the consequence of this policy state. But if that process is, is breaking down because the society is being made more inclusive and more democratic, why couldn't a skeptic just respond by saying, well, th- what, you're, what you're describing is a responsive democratic polity? Well, well, one response to this would be let it rip. Let's let it rip. Right. But I think that you would also say that democracies, the programs that democracies, modern democracies demand require a kind of credible commitment. Right. And this this state is unable to uh, secure any of its commitments. That is, everything remains contestable all the time. Everybody is in. All issues are national. Everything is contested and everything is reversible. So policy itself becomes, let me put it this way, policy to be secure requires rights and structure. It requires a secure decision-making, a dependable decision-making structure and secure rights. That's what gives policy legitimacy. If policy itself is undermining or abrading the security of rights and the security of structure, then policy is undermining its own legitimating anchors. That's what we want to say. Mm-hmm. And in that situation, that's a that's a predicament. That's a predicament. We're, you know, conservatives would say, right, we're making too much policy. We're making too much policy. Or too many people are in. We've got to get these people out, right? We've got to restrict access. We're not saying that. What we're saying, however, is that this policy state has serious uh, problems uh, largely related to the shakedown of institutional authority that accompanies its own development. Do you see any problems associated with the expansion of policy, the fact that we have so many decisions that are being that are being made and influenced by so many different actors? Do you see that as being a problem or posing a problem for for democratic legitimacy. So Steve yeah. Tellis at Johns Hopkins yeah. has, has made this argument that one of the problems that contemporary American government faces is just the bewildering complexity that's associated with the expansion of government mm-hmm. in the contemporary period. That seems as though it might be creating a, a problem for voters that are trying to monitor and direct and control what all of these different political decisions are actually involving. Mm-hmm. that might be separate and distinct from issues associated with enforcement of rights. Well, I mean, that, that makes sense to me. It's not exactly, mm-hmm. what, it's sure. not exactly what we're saying. I, I guess what we want to say is that there is no, there's no set institutional, uh, the institutional division of labor has completely broken down. Presidents make, Congress was supposed to make policy. Congress makes some policy, presidents make policy, judges make policy, bureaucrats make policy. There is no longer any set institutional locale. The institutional division of labor has completely broken down. And that makes authority less uh, dependable, mm-hmm. uh, less um, uh, no intelligible, mm-hmm. more contestable, uh, and less stable. That's what we're trying to say. Okay. Um, do you see any solutions to this problem? <laughs> no, this seems we're... like a fairly dour vision of contemporary contemporary right. governance, right. and, and uh, I think it's an accurate description of, of what has happened. But do you see any way of of changing this or or addressing this? Uh, well, uh, as I said, I, I'm better at diagnosis than I am at prescription. I don't have a solution. Um, so there is an argument that's circulating in legal circles about uh, 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 on left legal circles now constitutional rot, constitutional rot, and I think that there's something. Uh, and so, what are those arguments? R O T. Those so, those are that the uh, the constitutional crisis of our day is not. It's not a crisis in the sense of some extraordinary external event is causing, you know, is the, are we in a constitutional crisis because some event has happened, right? Mm-hmm. Trump may be impeached. That's a crisis, right? Constitution, constitutional rod is long-term processes of erosion that are breaking down the institutional fabric of American government. 
Now, what's the solution to that? I mean, some people would say we need a different constitution. I'm not sure that I want to go there. I mean, I think that's a pretty dangerous thing. But I mean, I can see that that we no longer have a constitution that corresponds in its organization to the um, the scope of policy making. That is po policy. This constitution was made to make policy about commerce and security. It mm -hmm. wasn't made to make policy about the things that were all excluded from policy space, social relations and labor relations and uh, family relations. Uh, so we might want to think about what kinds of institutions are more suitable to the scope of discretionary decision making. What kinds of institutions would those be? I don't. I mean, now you're asking me. Now <laughs> okay. you're asking me uh, beyond my pay grade. Okay. That's normative theory. Uh, we're really describing a set of institutional developments and describing them, and we want to describe this in a very empirical way. Yeah. That is, uh, the uh, the labor revolution of the 1930s. What was the constitutional implications of that? Well, the constitutional implications of that is the the, cons the commerce clause of the Constitution just basically breaks out. Uh, the bottom falls out of it as a limit on policy making. Well, government now regulate everything becomes commerce, right? Um, the civil rights revolution. These are the great democratic revolution. What were the constitutional implications of the civil rights revolution? Is well, federalism. Federalism breaks down as a kind of structural barrier on policy making. Uh, federalism doesn't go away. The commerce clause doesn't go away. So now we just compl we're just always contesting the boundaries of federalism and the boundaries of the Commerce Clause. And we have, there's no social uh, founding, there's no social foundation to what were once real, inst meaningful institutional barriers to the Commerce Clause, to federalism. Those have gone away. And now we just contest, right? Just contest one of the boundaries of federalism. Well, five to four, the Supreme Court will say this, and you know, five justices will say this, and four justices will say that. What are the boundaries of the Commerce Clause? Five to four. You know, nobody has it, there's no agreement. And it's not clear what's to be done about this. I, I don't know what the solution is, but I, I think that we have the right diagnosis. And it's not the diagnosis. Uh, I think it's very different than what you see coming out of the left and on the right. Mm -hmm. So on the right, I think that the argument is we have to, we should go back to the, the, go back to first principles, the way the Constitution was originalism. Well, we want to say that the original Constitution worked when most of people were excluded, right? When most people didn't have access to that decision-making structure and those institutional principles, and the more people who were brought in the more those principles and structures broke down. So it was just on, fun, it's just fundamentally incompatible. Right. What? And on the left, we want to say that we disagree with the left that the problems of modern governance today are just policy problems and that any necessary rearrangement of the furniture of the, of the government, that'll just take care of itself. We want to say that these problems of governance are really front and center, so much so that if you don't solve them, policy itself is going to lose its purchase. And I think that's what we see now. Policy itself loses its legitimating anchor, right? loses its, uh, its, uh, its staying power. Okay. Um, so do you have any, given, given that that's the diagnosis of the contemporary American political scene, do you have any, do you want to venture any predictions about what, what's in course. Do you see this as just being sort of a lasting trend that's been put in place that's going to continue? Um, well, I mean, this is kind of a dire, right? It is a kind of, it is kind of a dire. Uh, I don't think this is sustainable. I think that somehow we have to reconfigure, inst somehow we have to reconfigure institutional authority so that uh, rules have some, um, not only stability and regu but reliability, reliable permanence. Yeah. Um, so you know, I, I I recognize that there are all sorts of people who we're not the only people who are grappling with this. You know, so um, 
I think, I think conservatives have originalism. I think originalism is a response to the collapse of authority in the policy state. Um, uh, deliberative democracy. I think the whole deliberative democracy movement is a, is uh, is a response to the collapse of authority in the policies. So people, you know, normative theory is rich and alive with responses to this predicament. But we're just trying to. How did we get from there to here? How did we get from mm -hmm. there where we started to mm -hmm. this moment? Do, do you? Uh, I'm just curious. Do you see argument? Do you see deliberative democracy as is somehow addressing this in a in a in a in a way that you think might be fruitful? Do I think it's a practical solution? Yeah, I don't I, see it as a practical solution right now, but I do see it as a response to the problem. Yeah. Yeah. That is, I think, yeah. you know, John Dewey said you can't have a modern democracy unless there's some modicum of like-mindedness among the people, right? And deliberative democracy is a kind of one-on-one, -on -one, you have to build citizenship, right? A build a kind of common parlance uh, so that people are engaged in all, mm -hmm. you know, find some way to engage in all of this. So I see that deliberative democracy is a response to Really, the kinds of issues that Dewey was talking about, that is, you just can't have these bureaucrats making these decisions. It's going to create a crisis of authority, and it has. Mm -hmm. right? But do I think that deliberative democracy is a practical solution? Right now, I don't. I, right now, I don't. Why not? I just think it's too lo localized for the magnitude and the, the pace, the mm -hmm. acceleration. In uh -huh. some ways, I think that originalism and deliberative, de these solutions yeah. are reflections of yeah. the problem. Yeah. That is... Original juridical democracy. Well, right, because we don't have a rule of law. I agree with that. Deliberative democracy, because we don't have citizens able to engage in the scope of governmental decision making. I agree with that. These are reflections of the problem. Uh, I'm not sure they're practical solutions. Mm -hmm. And and you can't think of any practical solution that might exist. I don't spend a lot of time. I, I have a hard enough time just trying to work out, think about, think clearly about how our institutions got into the state that they're in. Mm -hmm. That's that's enough of a project for me. And it's a large enough one, <laughs> I suppose. Um, so, uh, where do you where do you see yourself going with research after this book? It's come to this sort of dour conclusion. In a certain <laughs> way, it's yeah. it's dealing with themes that you sort of were dealing with in your dissertation and then yeah. in your first book. Right. Um, what are you going to work on next? Um, uh, I don't know. I, I, right now I'm working on some papers that are sort of spin-offs of this, some mm -hmm. other implications of this. Um, uh, I don't know if I'll continue working on this. I may just do something completely different. Well, we look forward to reading it. Regardless of what, whatever you choose to, to work on next, looking forward to seeing what it is. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Steve. It's been a really interesting discussion, um, and uh, hope you hope you enjoyed hope you enjoyed it. Thanks, Sam.